Uh, thank, you, thank you for the introduction. So, um, you know, a lot of the talks that have been in today's room have been about uh, PCB design tools and things like that. Uh, we're going to go even lower than that. Uh, we're going to talk about building chips, uh, ASICs, with uh, open source tools. And OpenPython is not an open source uh, 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 CAD tool, but it is being used by a lot of open source CAD tools right now as a, uh, uh, the test suite for that. So what is OpenPython? Well, OpenPython is the world's first open source general purpose multi-thread many core, but it's, if you think about it, it's really a uh, best of breed sort of uh, many core architecture design where you have lots of different cores, general purpose cores that you can hit, uh, put together, all written in Verilog HDL and all open source. Uh, so our uh, design, uh, the, the, the core of it, or sorry, not the core, the, uh, most of it is uh, BSD licensed, and uh, one of the cores is uh, GPL, and some of the other cores are solder pad. But we can actually eat in lots of different uh, cores now. So now we actually have 10 different core types, uh, microprocessor core types, excuse me, with four different uh, instruction set architectures. And it was designed to be scalable, so it scales up to about a half billion cores, but I don't really recommend actually trying to build that. Um, but uh, the, the secret sauce here is that you can actually have a configurable and uh, cache coherent interface where you can hook together lots of cores in a, we'll, I'll show some pictures of this in a 2D mesh uh, design and build very large chips. And it's all open source so, so you can use this in your open source CAD tools. And in fact, I will be talking about at the end of today's talk that there is a um, bunch, there's a big movement now for open source EDA hardware tools and they're using uh, OpenPython as the, the development uh, test uh, for that. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some other sort of, sort of things is this is, as I said, sort of chip level. We've actually built these, some of these chips, and I'll talk about that in a second. But from a simulation perspective, we support all the uh, commercial and uh, open source uh, simulators these days for, for Verilog. So the, 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 uh, we have Icarus Verilog and Verilator are some of the, the two sort of most popular open source uh, EDA uh, Verilog simulators uh, these days. It's, this design has been ASIC verified and FPGA verified, and we'll talk about that in a second. And we've done very careful power analysis um, at, on the actual ASIC we've built and cross-referenced that with the open source uh, design. So you can go and, and uh, use that to make sure your tools, your EDA tools, are doing the right thing. Because that's really important is you want to have sort of a design reference of maybe something that may have went through a commercial tool and see if that actually you're getting good quality of results or something like that uh, from, from this whole thing. And I should also say, you know, this runs... Full stack Debian Linux, it's a full uh, working uh, many core design with, uh, you know, we've built chips with 25 cores, we can scale up to, you know, many, many more cores. So that's OpenPython. Well, we took OpenPython and we extended it um, and started adding more cores. The original OpenPython actually used an Open Spark core. So Spark's an open instruction set that the old you know, Sun systems used to use. And uh, Sun had open sourced that at some point. And now um, we've extended it. You know, RISC-V is sort of becoming hot these days. So we wanted to add in sort of RISC-V support. Um, because in reality, OpenPython, we don't really care that much about the core. We care much more about the uncore and building a scalable uncore. So we took, uh, in a collaboration with ETH Zurich and the uh, Pulp team, and integrated the uh, Ariane core. So the Ariane core is a, a general purpose 64-bit uh, RISC-V processor, which we've uh, integrated in collaboration with uh, ETH Zurich and the, the Pulp team, as I said before. And what was actually really kind of cool about this is we were able to do this integration, and it took us less than six months from the time we started integrating our, our uh, register transfer language uh, Verilog code to the point where we actually had uh, you know, working design in FPGA booting uh, SMP Linux. So these are silicon proven designs, and that's something you really need if you're going to go build and use your open source CAD tool is, you know, has this actually, is this uh, real designs? Is it not just synthetic designs? So I'll talk a little bit about synthetic designs in a second of why that's not really great for using uh, for your CAD tools. So um, <clears throat> what are the sort of chips we built? Well, we built uh, the Python processor at, uh, at uh, Princeton, which is a 25 core, uh, many core implementation of this. It uses uh, three on-chip networks, a directory-based cache coherence system. This was taped out in IBM's 32 nanometer uh, process a few years back. And it was about 460 million transistors, which is one of the largest academic chips uh, ever built. Um, <clears throat> at ETH Zurich, the Ariane team has taped out uh, a couple different variants, uh, one named Poseidon, one named uh, Cosmodrome, where Ariane sort of shows up as uh, processors used in the ETH uh, Zurich uh, work. And now we're actually working to sort of uh, build uh, chips together. And we're going to be taping out uh, this year some open PTOM plus Ariane designs in uh, 12 nanometer uh, process. 
So as I said, you know, you want to not just uh, target uh, or be a good open source uh, uh, design just for ASIC design. You also want to, you know, be good for uh, the uh, FPGA world. So uh, we mapped to a bunch of different FPGAs, and we've shown this. So we have things from sort of one, two cores and relatively inexpensive boards uh, all the way up to, to many cores or, well, 12 cores in sort of quite expensive uh, boards. And the other thing that uh, we've been talking about recently and have done recently is we now uh, have this on Amazon F1. So in Amazon AWS or Amazon Web Services, you can rent a FPGA in the cloud for about $1.60 an hour. I don't know what it is in the European uh, uh, world, if they have the, actually the F1 instances, they might just be in the States, but you can use those and rent it. And then you don't need to own a $8,000 test board to go do this. You can go rent uh, some, you know, dollar sixty an hour prorated uh, d uh, board, which then you can go use and actually develop and sort of test out these types of things. Okay. So what's, what's sort of the, the design system here in open P time, as I said, it's a, uh, 2d mesh structure. So each of these things is a tile. Um, inside of a tile, we have uh, network on chip routers. Let me zoom in here for a second. So we have three routers. We have a slice of a last level shared cache with a directory. Uh, and then we have a private cache and we have uh, the core here. And then we have a lot of off chip chipset uh, stuff, which is actually really helpful if you're trying to go build a CAD tool. You don't just want cores and you just don't want interconnect. You want sort of everything to go test your CAD tools. So we've gotten a lot of feedback from people who are using this that they actually want the variety of all the things that you could possibly sort of put together. So this is sort of the Open Python system. Nowadays, we're doing Open Python plus Arian. So literally, we just sort of took Open Python, ripped it, or sorry, took the Open Spark core, ripped it out, and put in uh, the uh, Arian core. And, and there's a lot of uh, work that went into that. It's not quite as easy just ripping it out and putting it in. Uh, but we have a paper uh, coming out at, together with uh, the ETH Zurich team at Ask Plus uh, in two months where we talk a lot about how to go do that and build the infrastructure where you can plug in lots of different core types, which are vastly different. Okay, so this brings me up to the sort of CAD world here. So what is the, we've, we've heard a lot about um, EDA tools for PCBs. What's the state of the art sort of uh, in the chip world? Well, they're used, but maybe not uh, anyone's actually sort of taping out chips right now with that. And that's, that's sad, in my opinion. Um, and what's missing? Well, we've had a lot of tools for, from academic groups for verification. We have uh, open source flow for uh, some very small FPGAs these days. Um, but, you know, in reality, we want to sort of get to the point where we can tape out large uh, chips, at least academic chips or maybe commercial chips, with a full open source uh, uh, EDA tool flow for the chips uh, side. So when people have traditionally tested these things, they are a lot of times been using sort of old industrial designs to go do their test. And um, one of the things, or they're using old academic designs. And one of the biggest problems here is they're really limited in scale. So if you go look at sort of the uh, designs out there that people have used traditionally to test uh, EDA tools in academia, they're using sort of example designs or they're using very small designs or they're using obfuscated designs that are coming from industry that are not uh, particularly open or realistic. They're typically very synthetic. And we see, uh, you know, Open Python, Open Python plus Arian as a mechanism to get like real designs that people have actually taped out and can scale to big design points uh, going through large uh, chip flows, uh, open source chip flows. Okay, so you know, what, do you, what is really needed here to be a good benchmark or a good use case for open source EDA uh, uh, chip CAD flows? First thing you want is you want a lot of different design variety. And uh, we provide that. So we have big cores, we have small cores, we have caches, we have interconnect, we have actually a GPU, GPU which is connected into this. Uh, we have uh, different I.O. And we uh, now have been adding different accelerators into this design mix. So you can basically build complex SOCs out of this design point, And we're going to be taping out some of them so that people can use them as reference points. You also want a lot of configurability. So you want to be able to, uh, you know, change up different design points because we've heard back from the people that are sort of using this that, you know, you want to be able to sort of uh, uh, try different scale and try small scale first. And then as you get bigger and bigger and you want to, like, look at, you know, what's going on, you want to, you know, try and stress your DRC checking at the scale, but you also want to test it in the sort of small case first. So we want to have this different scale. And, you know, we can build big designs or big, uh, you know, real designs that will work in, and at least in simulation, you know, uh, uh, you know, run real programs, but, you know, uh, no one has a 500 million core design really out there yet because, you know, Moore's law has ended. You can't go build chips that big. Um, okay, so 
In OpenPTAN, it's not just Verilog. Um, we also give out all of the accoutrements you might need. So we have verification test benches. We have eight, over 8,000 test cases. Um, so if you're building, for instance, a uh, open source verification tool um, that does the uh, CAD side, um, you have test cases for that. Uh, we also have the power analysis and thermal analysis, and we have some PCB designs that, uh, for those of you who do build PCB designs, you should, you know, please take a look at our, you know, boards as uh, input for that. They're pretty complicated designs, though. They're like 14 layer PCBs that are, uh, but they're all open and out there uh, if you go to our website. So this is an example of one of the boards here. You know, a pretty complex uh, test board um, that we use to do this sort of careful uh, power analysis. And, you know, we've taken this whole Python chip and done careful power analysis and sort of come up with good ground truth. Um, so what is a good ground truth here? So, for instance, we uh, measured the energy per hop on your network uh, on chip. So if you're going to build a best of breed uh, uh, network these days, you can go and actually go look at our paper, and it'll tell you sort of how much energy is used for that. And in reality, it's about eight. Uh, you can go about eight hops on our NOC, our network on chip, for the energy equivalent of one, let's say, ALU. And that debunks the myth of that NOCs are really expensive from an energy perspective. It's just, it's just not true. Um, also, you know, we've done a fair amount of thermal analysis. And sort of, you can see the, the nice thermal pictures here. Um, but we've also sort of looked at how much energy it takes to do loads versus stores and uh, different instruction uh, energy usages. And it's really important that this is open source because when we were doing this, you know, we were doing the characterization. Well, we designed it so we can go look at it. But if, if it wasn't open source, it wouldn't be that useful to have these sort of on-chip network energy numbers and, and uh, instruction energy numbers because you wouldn't be able to go look in the design. But because it's all open source, you can go look at it. Okay, so this brings us a little bit back to the uh, EDA tools here. You know, we use a lot of these tools, and this is actually uh, part of a, a big DARPA program called IDEA where uh, people are building lots of different CAD design tools that are open source, and we're uh, the uh, design advisors, so we're giving a lot of this advice and designs out to the users. So um, we use lots of different open source uh, uh, tools here, and we're not just using it, but we're actually contributing back. So we've actually uh, filed a bunch of bug reports against all these uh, different open source tools here. And you know, we really need, as just going back to uh, just to sort of uh, running out of time here, but to sum up that you know, we want to go back to sort of think about what do we need to have a full open source chip CAD flow, which is a lot. You know, there's a lot of uh, problems you need to go solve there. So actually, the right here is a picture of our uh, uh, CAD flow we use sort of commercially. Um, and then we're sort of think, taking all that input and thinking, what do we need in the open source world? And you need, uh, you know, hierarchical synthesis. You need, you know, two pass designs. You need to be able to do uh, engineering change orders. Um, and you need uh, you know, good support for gate level verification. And this is all these things that a lot of these open source tools don't currently support. So what is missing and what is sort of coming along here? So I'm going to make a plug for actually two programs that are not mine. Um, they're not collaborators, but, uh, but they're people I know well. Um, so the first is um, UC uh, San Diego, led by uh, Andrew Kong, uh, has been building this thing called Open Road, which is the closest that we actually have today to a full chip uh, EDA CAD flow, and we're working with them, giving them designs that they're actually going to tape out, and then we're using their tools, and we're going to tape out some uh, chips with full open source chip level EDA CAD tools. <clears throat> also, um, the University of Washington, under, uh, as a subcontractor under my program, um, has been building a, uh, a basically a packaging of those tools to go build a full flow, because it's not enough just to have the tools. Um, this is something you learn as you're sort of in the chip business, is the tools are just the tools. The glue that holds it together of the flow and how do you put together the tools and how to use all the flags is actually more important, so basically, than the tools, or is just as important as the tools. Um, because it takes years to sort of develop. So we're, we're you know, expert chip designers, and we're using these tools and sort of building that flow for the open source world. And uh, uh, Mike Taylor's group at the University of Washington has released that uh, down here, uh, using the open road packaged together with a uh, free... Na uh, uh, a 45 nanometer uh, fake library that's uh, free that people can use to go test this out together. What's missing? Okay, so um, let's say the open road design is the you know, most advanced sort of chip level open source CAD tools out there, but there's still a lot of things missing. So first of all, um, there is no DRC tool uh, for uh, chip level DRC that exists today. You know, the DRC, DRC decks are really complex, especially, you know, we're taping out stuff in 12 nanometer. It's all FinFET stuff. The rules, like, you go read the, the manual, and you can't even understand some of the rules, right? So, the, you know, very complicated uh, DRC decks. 
So you need, we need a DRC tool. Uh, second, you know, Yosis is great, but we need Yosis to be uh, even, even better. We found lots of problems with Yosis um, in particular. I mean, it's not just like system bear log support. Let's say we get around that. Um, but uh, you know, we, we've seen recently something where the way they do asynchronous clocking just doesn't really make sense to us, even for you know, synchronous circuits, like the asynchronous reset, just, just kind of doesn't make sense. Um, and then uh, parasitic uh, uh, tools, better system Verilog support, that's actually coming along a little bit faster than I was expecting. And then things that people don't um, really think about is sort of parasitic extraction at the chip level. I think there's a talk about parasitic extraction or 3D uh, uh, field modeling here in this session. Uh, but at the chip level, it's actually pretty, uh, it's a slightly different game than the board level. And then uh, power grid and sing uh, signal integrity issues. So we're building a billion transistor chip with the open source uh, uh, OpenFlow tools. We're taping this out in Global Foundry's uh, 12 nanometer. We're really excited to go do this. And then I want to make a final plug here for uh, we are uh, also uh, here today as part of the uh, Decades project, which I also lead now uh, in the DARPA SDH Software Defined Hardware Program, where we're also looking at all these open source designs and the Open Python design used to go build a heterogeneous uh, many core platform. Okay, so we have a whole community. Um, think about time, but you know you can go to our GitHub uh, page. I want to acknowledge all the great uh, students that have gone into this. Uh, we like to go do fun things. We went camping at the at the Grand Canyon this year, um, and the Ariane team and the uh, University of Washington team, and then finally Open Road is doing some really great stuff. Um, you should all go check out Open Road. Okay, and I think I'm out of time, so I will end there. You're, you're saying why? Uh, so the question is, why, why are we taping out doing, chips? Like, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of, I know like for academics, they do like low volume tape outs, but, and then at what point would you, like with this transition into maybe a commercial product or something? Okay, so, so why, uh, I guess, the, so repeat the question, you know, why are academics building very large billion transistor chips and, you know, when does this transition to industry, I guess, is the question. Um, yeah, so, um, my research is computer architecture, primarily. So we want to test out new computer architecture ideas. Um, you can simulate that, but a lot of times the intuition is, is wrong from the simulation, or you miss a lot of details when you don't actually go implement it. Um, so a lot of people do sort of software level simulation of architectural ideas, and it doesn't capture enough of what the real problems are uh, when you actually sort of physically build it. Um, so that's sort of the one answer. The commercialization um, question, I've commercialized things I've built in academia before. So many years ago in graduate school, I uh, worked in the MIT raw processor, which got commercialized in the Tylera chip. Um, so things can spin out. Um, in academia, that's not our goal. Our goal is, yeah, you know, we get back you know, 40 to 100 die, um, and we typically use shuttle runs. So shuttle runs or multi-project wafer aggregation is where you have lots of different designs. They aggregate together. Um, so you're wearing an Oshpark shirt. Well, Oshpark kind of does the same thing at the board level. Um, but at the chip level, that's pretty common. Um, but then, uh, yeah, you can go commercial. I mean, this stuff's sort of com commercial level uh, ideas here, but it's really a test on new architecture uh, ideas. Cool. Yeah. How do you see the interface with the foundries when you need to get the PDPs from the foundries to see? Yeah, it's a great question here. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, how, how, how uh, as an academic, how do we interface with the foundries and how do we get the PDKs? And it's not just the PDKs, it's also the uh, intellectual property that you otherwise need. So the PDK is just the design rules you also need, like standard cells, RAMs, IOs, PLLs, if you can get one of those, uh, things like that. So um, relationships. Um, so yeah, we license it. Um, typically, a lot of stuff is uh, you know, free for academic use, but uh, there's also a lot of restrictions on it. Um, and yeah, you need to sort of work through that. It's not easy to get. Um, the, the harder thing maybe than just getting access is getting access to something as advanced as like 12 nanometer. Um, so a lot of the foundries will not give academics access to anything that's sort of near the bleeding edge. Um, and that 12 nanometer, at least for global foundries, is their bleeding edge. Um, so yeah, the, those relationships, you have to know, you know uh, uh, people. There, I'll put a plug in here. I know uh, uh, Metro sitting in the back of the room. There's maybe some opportunities for other free PDKs coming along. Um, that's a problem, you know, it's, it's their proprietary IP of, you know, what are the design rules for a uh, PDK, and I don't know, 
that's, that's a hard to solve problem to make that open. Yeah. So maybe you can do that for like old designs, old, yeah, is, is, uh, things that I've heard floated. Okay, thank you so much.